The Suikoden franchise has a loyal following. It has earned this with scenes of epic scope as well as touching, personal moments. Suikoden 1 and 2 are my favorite JRPGs on the PlayStation 1, outpacing the Final Fantasy games. That's my opinion, but I dare say I'm not the only one. Today on Arcadeology, I'm covering a game that I've held dear to my heart for over 20 years. Welcome to Arcadeology, Suikoden. I recall finding Suikoden. I was with my grandma at the mall, and we had stopped into an electronics boutique. An obsession with RPGs marked my early gaming life. Unfortunately, I had a Genesis, a console not known for its RPG selection. Of course, there was Fantasy Star and Shining Force, but they were not enough. Don't get me wrong, I love both franchises, but I could only replay the games I had so many times. The early years of the PlayStation were rather slim as well. The first RPG released for the PlayStation was From Software's King's Field, but it never made it over to the States. King's Field 2 would have that honor, but unfortunately I never got a chance to play it. I had rented Beyond the Beyond, another early RPG for Sony's system, and I found it lacking. Then, in that electronics boutique, I saw the box for Suikoden. A new RPG for the PlayStation? I had to have it. My grandmother bought it for me, and when I got home and started the game, I was immediately enthralled. The story was epic, yet so personal, and took me on a ride that I had never quite felt before. Before I spoil anything, let's start back at the beginning of how this game got made. Development of the game took place at Konami Computer Entertainment Tokyo. Direction of the game was under the guidance of Yoshitaka Moriyama. Moriyama graduated from the University of Tokyo with a degree in programming in 1992. Konami was Moriyama's first and only job interview, where he got hired as a bug tester. Yet he didn't spend too much time in that position. Six months into his career, his manager told him he was being pulled onto a top-secret project. The 16-bit generation of consoles was coming to a close. Despite the rivalry between Sega and Nintendo, there seemed to be no clear frontrunner heading into the next generation. Konami decided to throw their hat into the first-party ring and release a console of their own. Moriyama was one of the few employees selected to develop games for this new console. It was on this project that he met artist and Suikoden collaborator Junko Kawano. The two worked together on developing an RPG for the mysterious Konami console. According to Moriyama, Konami intended the console to be handheld. It would also run off ROM cartridges and support 3D graphics. Sounds to me a little like the Nintendo Switch long before the Switch was possible. After about a year, Konami canceled the console and disbanded the development teams. Yet only a week later, management pulled Moriyama into another project. This time they selected him, along with Kawano, and others to develop a game for the Sony PlayStation. Konami assigned only 10 employees to the development of PlayStation games. They kept the rest of the staff focused on 16-bit consoles. There were five options presented to the 10 designers. A racing game, a baseball game, or one of three RPGs. Moriyama paired up with Kawano to work on an RPG as they had spent the previous year toying with the genre. If Konami had listed action as an option though, Moriyama would have preferred that. In an interview with Swedish gaming magazine Level, Moriyama mentioned a desire to work on a game like Taito's Metal Black. For Suikoden fans everywhere, I'm glad that was not an option. A wide variety of games fed Moriyama's imagination during development. Dragon Quest V was a genre touchstone. A programming quirk gave Moriyama an idea for an intersection between gameplay and storytelling. Each time the priest resurrected your character in Dragon Quest V, his speech slowed. This was reflected in Suikoden during the gameplay before a particular character's demise. Moriyama said in his level interview, he made the character more frustrating to play to enhance their sacrifice when the moment came. Other influential games include Sid Meier's Civilization and Taito's Metal Black, though their influences are less obvious. A negative game influence for Moriyama was the Black Onyx. The Black Onyx was an 80s CRPG developed by Bulletproof Software. Moriyama felt the game was too complex and had complicated puzzles. He wanted Suikoden to be a streamlined experience for the player. A fun side note, Hank Rogers owned Bulletproof Software, the same Hank Rogers who would go on to secure the rights to Tetris for Nintendo. For plot influences, Moriyama took great inspiration from the mangas Captain Tsubasa and Fist of the North Star. 
Captain Tsubasa is a manga about a soccer team captain, and Fist of the North Star is a manga about a warrior named Kenshiro surviving in a post-apocalyptic world. Yet, when he was getting ready to pitch the game to his manager, the idea that his manager would not resonate with the manga concerned Moriyama. So he decided to lean on a different influence, an ages-old Chinese novel called The Water Margin. In the prologue of The Water Margin, translator Edwin Lowe provides a history of the story. Written in the 1300s during the Ming Dynasty, the story follows a group of 108 outlaws who form an army. Scholars consider it one of the four great novels of vernacular Chinese literature. Moriyama's manager misunderstood the gist of the pitch. Moriyama was looking to set the game in a world like the water margin, but what his manager took hold of was the 108 outlaws aspect. Because of this, the game would ultimately be named after the Japanese name for the water margin, Suikoden. As Moriyama fleshed out the world, he took inspiration from other literature, such as the Eternal Champion books written by Michael Moorcock. After six months of tireless work, Moriyama and Kawano finally got some help. Management folded the other two RPG teams into the Suikoden staff. It was at a much needed time, too. Moriyama and Kawano were at their wit's end with the amount of work that the project was shaping up to be. Creating 108 characters was a difficult task for the team. Moriyama would have the team members pitch new characters every day. There were many that would not make the cut. Moriyama mentioned a funny anecdote in his interview with Level Magazine. A staffer kept pitching a character that was a dead ringer for the mascot of the Yokohama Marinos, a professional soccer team in Japan. Eventually, they were able to work through all 108 characters or Stars of Destiny. Suikoden's development had many obstacles thrown in its way. The project was led by a rookie game designer and a young artist, yet with their sheer force of will, talent, and luck, they persevered. They guided a project through the collapse of an in-house console project. They pushed through a limited budget and an overambitious project plan. And when they finally crossed the finish line, their victory was short-lived. QA had discovered a game-breaking bug in the gold copy of the game. The team returned to their offices and worked out the bug before finally taking a break. So what is it about Suikoden that is so special? The plot and the characters combine to make a fantastic story. I'll be spoiling the inciting incident of the game, but I will attempt to avoid any of the big twists and turns. The nameable player character, who many refer to as Tyr, is the son of an Imperial Army general named Tio McDall. While Tio is off on the border with his army, Tyr and his friend Ted, and Tio's three servants, Pon, Cleo, and Gremio, join the Imperial Army. While off on a mission on their own, a ferocious monster attacks them. Ted reveals himself to be the carrier of a true rune, a symbol embedded in his hand that gives him tremendous power. When they return to their home in Gregminster, Ted is summoned to the castle. Wendy, the court magician, reveals herself as a villain. She has been after Ted's rune for centuries. In a fight, Wendy deals Ted a fatal wound, but he manages to escape. Back at the McDowell estate, Ted bequeaths the rune to Tyr. Unfortunately, Pond betrays the group and tells the Imperial Guards that Ted has found his way back. Ted passes away, but not before creating enough of a distraction for Tyr to get away. While on the run, Tyr, Gremio, and Cleo are assisted by a man named Victor, who takes them to the base of a secret rebellion. From there, the game broadens in scope. Through fate and happenstance, Tyr becomes the leader of a rebel army based in a castle in the middle of a lake. He is leading the fight against the Emperor, who his father has sworn allegiance to dramatic stuff. The castle, by the way, is how they avoided the need for too many combat characters. It opened up the options for characters that could be recruited. Many characters could do more passive things. Some opened shops in the castle, another managed the storeroom, or some acted as blacksmiths. One even lets you install an elevator, allowing you to get between levels faster. Let's talk about the gameplay. Aside from the 108 characters in the game, one of the most interesting aspects is the rune system. Moriyama said in an interview with the Suikoden Revival Movement, the idea of the rune system came from a card game in Japan. Unfortunately, collectible card games are not my area of expertise. If anyone has any information on which game that might be, please post it in the comments down below. The rune system allows magic use in the world of Suikoden. For a contemporary comparison, think of the materia system used in Final Fantasy VII. Some runes are generic, like fire, and allow characters to cast fire spells, but the true runes are one of a kind. They allow the character to perform unique magic spells. Magic points were not used in Suikoden. Instead, characters could cast a limited number of spells between rest. According to Moriyama, 
Wizardry, a CRPG from the 80s, served as the inspiration for this. Surtex Software based Wizardry on Dungeons & Dragons Magic System. The developer was also known for the Jagged Alliance games. There are three phases of combat in Suikoden. The most common are the standard party-based encounters. These happen as random encounters on the world map or in dungeons. You control up to six characters aligned in two rows of three. Placement of your characters matters. Short range must be in the front row and can only attack the enemy's front row. Medium range can be in either row and can only attack the enemy's front row. Long range can be anywhere and can attack anywhere but should stay in the back row. Characters with lower defense and hit points are often long range. The other two types of combat are duels and army battles. Duels feature one-on-one -on -one simplified combat. You have three options during a duel, attack, defend, and desperate attack. In essence, duels are rock, paper, scissors. Attack defeats defend, defend beats desperate attack, and desperate attack beats attack. It's not all guesswork though. The combatants will often trash talk and this will give away their next move. Army battles pit your entire army against another army. As the game progresses, these battles become larger in scale. Army battles also had an element of rock, paper, scissors. Infantry beat archers, archers beat mages, and mages beat infantry. Reviving certain characters killed during army battles is impossible. Characters that cannot be revived were ones that were inconsequential to the plot. Yet, it still hurt when you lost one that you had made a connection with. This gives these battles a whole different level of treachery. The music in the Suikoden series has always been a high point. Konami legend Miki Higashino composed most of the music. Higashino joined Konami in 1984 after spending time studying music composition in college. Konami was looking for a part-time composer for their games. Higashino didn't know much about game music, but took on the job regardless. In 1995, Suikoden provided her the first opportunity to score a game that used recorded music. Higashino said that it was after reading the scenario for the game that she realized the need for a wide variety of world music. Upon release, Suikoden was a PlayStation exclusive in the United States. In other markets, it was available on more platforms. According to Suikosource, Suikoden was also released on PC and Sega Saturn in Japan. In recent years, the game has seen several re-releases. In 2006, Suikoden was re-released in Japan on the Sony PSP handheld. Suikoden 1 saw a re-release on PSN a few years after that, followed by Suikoden 2 a few more years later. Unfortunately, they are only compatible on the PlayStation 3. Recently, there has been a push to get Suikoden released on Steam. The Suikoden revival movement has been using hashtag Suikoden on Steam to get Konami's attention. As of right now though, despite Konami acknowledging the movement, there has been no updates from the former video game company. Suikoden would spawn four sequels, several spin-offs, and other media. The immediate follow-up, Suikoden 2, is often cited as one of the greatest RPGs of that generation. Story, characters, combat, all became much more interesting in the second installment. Despite this, I still hold a very special place in my heart for the first one, which my grandma bought me. Thank you so much for watching this episode. Special thanks to Kasper Nowakowski for providing me the copy of an interview he had with Yoshitaka Moriyama. All the sources I used are down in the description of the video. I love this game, and I wanted to dig into how it came about. I feel like I accomplished that. But as always, if you have any sources that you find to the contrary, please mention it in the pin fact check comment down below. Additionally, I'm now in the podcasting space. Currently, I am re-releasing some of my early videos as podcasts, but we'll be adding original material and interviews shortly. Thanks so much for watching. Take care.